to introduce uh, Professor David Bowell, our EFC Scientific Vice President. It's a pleasure to hear you. He will give us some words about this uh, series of webinars. So, David, please. Thanks very much, uh, Pedro. It's a great uh, pleasure for me to to be here and to launch this um, set of uh, webinars. So I, as Pedro said, I'm currently scientific vice president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineers. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at uh, University College London. So what we decided to do is we had a series of 11 spotlight talk sessions um, uh, organized by our working, uh, working parties and sections. So there are 11 of these across the next two weeks they're all quite short, three or four talks by leading industrial and academic experts. I won't read out the list of, of, of the areas, but you can see that from the website. And they're to focus on key topics in the area. And really, I would like to encourage all of us to, to explore the different uh, areas of the European Federation of Chemical Engineers, because we don't get um, uh, the opportunity to do that. So often we focus on our own specific uh, subparts of, of the discipline. So that's one of the reasons we put this together, that people can dip in and out of any of these 11 uh, um, uh, sessions over the next uh, couple of weeks. So just a few words about the European Federation of Chemical Engineers. If any, there may be some who are not uh, um, uh, so familiar. We promote scientific collaboration to support the work of chemical engineers and, and collaborating professionals in 30 uh, European countries. Uh, that's over, over 100,000 chemical engineers uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so with our working partisan sections, we cover all aspects, all areas of chemical engineering and the, the working party and section meetings um, uh, go on, of course, throughout the year. And all of our working parties and sections do involve, their, their committees involve, people from academia and from industry, and indeed some people from outside of Europe. It's, we don't just focus entirely on, on, uh, on European activities. So the working parties and sections, though, are right at the core of the activity of the uh, European Federation, and they're, they're the scientific engine that drives the European Federation uh, activities. And each one focuses on a different aspect of chemical engineering, and they really form this important forum for networking amongst chemical engineers. You might be aware the European Federation also sponsors a, uh, the European Chemical Engineering Conference every two years. And the next one, well, is planned to be in, in Berlin next, uh, next uh, summer, subject to uh, um, the, the, um, the, 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 the virus and, and, and what happens to it, but we're still aiming for and hoping for a face-to-face -face event in Berlin uh, um, later in the year. So with that, let me hand back to Pedro and, um, uh, and uh, uh, we look forward to this, uh, this, this uh, session. Thank you, David, for your nice introduction and opening of the webinars. It's a pleasure. Uh, I would like also to, to thank EFC for, for the opportunity of organizing the webinar and especially Professor Martin Fu for her work and, and, and effort in organizing the spotlight and also in his conduct for the technical support of the, the webinar. And of course, I would like to thank you all of you for attending the webinar for many countries worldwide, or at least this is what I guess watching the, the names. We are happy to see that it attracts attention of to many people. And well, this uh, spotlight is devoted to electrostatic in industry, especially its risk, how to measure electrostatic phenomena and properties, uh, and how to evaluate materials. We have four very interesting talks on these topics. I hope you will enjoy them. Um, this is the schedule uh, we will follow today. And um, okay, I will just say first a few words about the activity of our working party within EFCE and especially about uh, static electricity in industry and our coming uh, international conference on electrostatics in, in 2022. Okay, mm, our activity is focused, of course, is devoted to the problems and application of static electricity. Mm, static electricity is an old, relatively well-known topic, but which is present today 
and not always well understood. Let's say there are two parts. There are the part of risk and the part of applications. Uh, in the side of risk, we have, of course, safety incidents, explosions, damage to electronics, and sometimes some difficulties to understand what is going on with uh, static electricity or electrostatic processes in, in industry. And the, of course, there are standards which try to help uh, people in the industry to handle this, this situation. But again, sometimes they need some explanation or some physical foundation of the, of the, the recommendation or the rules they, they give. Um, so in that side, we will have uh, the first talk with the incidents, which will be done by Simon Egan. And uh, for the basics or in the principles of electrostatic, we have the talk of Philippe Molinier. And uh, then Jeremy and Paul will give us some, uh, some insights in, in the standards and the problems of measuring static properties in, in industry. Um, but I would also like to point that the application of a static electricity, not, not everything is problems with static electricity. We have precipitators, separators, ozone generation, and new, more new applications like electro spinning, electro spraying. And a very new, this is electrodynamic flow controlled by electrostatic discharge or micro pumping or, or flow control in aerodynamics. Um, some new applications in the aerospace industry, we can find some of them in our conference uh, very regularly for dust cleaning of panels. Uh, high voltage current, DC current, which is now uh, growing, and it's also giving rise to some problems, biological application, and so on. And in our working party, we, um, we, we have um, experts from Europe and from countries outside, outside Europe, and we try to promote the research activity in the field and the diffusion of electrostatics in industry. And our main um, spot is the conference we organize uh, every four years. And this, this year it was intended to be done in 2021 in Poland, but we move it to 2022 because of course of the coronavirus crisis. The dates are now established. It's from 28th March to 1st April 2022. We hope that by this time, uh, at least the coronavirus crisis will be nearly finished and we will be able to have a in-person conference. But of course, things are changing, so we also will have a possibility to connect online to this conference for the first time in our series conference and uh, to give opportunity to, to people with difficulty to travel also to, to follow the conference. Mm. This conference is every four years. We have, a, let's say, a sister conference every two years also, shifted from ours, uh, which is organized by the Institute of Physics. and. Uh, this, for this edition, we will be relatively close because the next IOP conference will be in 2023. So, but it's a very special situation, of course. The organization of the conference will be um, done by the uh, Faculty of Mechanical and Power Engineering. The chairman is uh, Professor Slavomir Petrovic, and his team will help him in, in organizing the conference. It's a very nice place, Rock Club, and I hope we can enjoy it at the beginning of the spring in 2022. Uh, for us, it is also a very important conference because during the organization, we lost uh, Professor Julius Gajewski. Uh, sorry, I did put his name. Um, he was the promoter of the conference in Broklau, and uh, we, we miss him and we want to, to honor him with this conference. He was an expert in electrical engineering and also a, a value teacher, an educator of many generations of students, engineers, and PhD students. He was a, a very good friend of us. I would like to point also a very important aspect of our conference is that the proceedings are published on the Journal of Electrostatics uh, after a peer review process. So it takes a little time to, it's a, quite long to, to have all the papers reviewed and accepted for publication. And this is why the call for abstracts is now open. Uh, until 15 December of this year, 2020. Um, then we will communicate uh, uh, acceptance of abstracts and we will call, the, the call for papers for 
complete papers later on. There will be during 2021 a second form for papers for those who do not want to publish on the journal of electrostatics or at that time were not ready, but they want to participate on the conference and that will be announced later in 2021. Um, here you have the contact information. I will try to show it again later on during the, the webinar. If you type Electrostatics 2022 in Google, you will find it. Or even if you type 2021, <laughs> you will also find because, okay, of course, we start promotion and then we have to change the date. Pedro, sorry to interrupt, but um, you're not. We're not seeing your screen. No, but it's blue. Sorry. Thank you for. Why not? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. Thanks. I will try to try now. And now it's, is it working? That's, that's okay. Oh, sorry. So I will come back <laughs> just to show the pictures. <laughs> we have Bro Club that to, to help you. This probably was done because I had two screens and uh, I don't know why it didn't work. I was clicking on sharing screen, it didn't work. So that's Bro Club the Faculty of Mechanical and Power Engineering, uh, our dear Professor Julius Gajewski, sorry. And um, okay, the General of Statics and the contact information. So now with images, that's better. <laughs> that's, I will just finish my, my introduction, giving uh, just a short presentation of Dr. Simon Egan. The, he will give us the first talk. Uh, learning lesson from five, five electrostatic incidents. He worked on chemical processes development from 1975 to 1920 in England. And then he has been working on chemical process safety in France. He is active in the field of static electricity and pressure relief devices. So if there are no more technical problems, I will give Simon the control of the screen and start sharing my, my screen now. So please, Simon. Thank you, Pedro. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to go into presentation mode. And before I do anything else, I'm going to ask, is that working? Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. With a presentation, learning lessons from five electrostatic mm -hmm. incidents. Uh, sorry, Simon, we just one question. If, you, if the audience has questions, please use the, the chat system or the question and answer system. You have to write them and we will collect them and answer them at the end of Simon's presentation. Okay, so, so go on, Simon, sorry. Thank you, Pedro. My name is Egan, okay. Simon Egan, and I'm proud to work for the Solvay Group of Companies, giving training and giving advice to process safety engineers, trying to prevent explosions, fires, and leaks of toxic materials. Safety is very important to us in Solvay. Today, I'm going to talk about what we can learn from five electrostatic incidents. Today, we're going to look at electrostatic discharges which occurred from a leaking steam pipe, some which occurred inside a solid charging chute, some which occurred during the gravity transfer of a solid material, some which occurred during pneumatic transfer of a solid material, some which occurred inside a precipitator, 
I will give some general advice on the prevention of incentive electrostatic discharges and finish with a short summary. Let's start with the electrostatic discharges that we saw in one of our factories coming from a leaking steam pipe. Now you wouldn't think that leaking steam pipes could give rise to electrostatic discharges, but on one occasion at least they did. We saw these discharges near to a steam pipe. The steam pipe had rock wool insulation with steel covers. That's absolutely typical. It was situated in a classified hazardous zone, a zone two area. We had just done some work to install some cable trays above the steam pipe. The cable trays were made of steel perfectly typical, and they had epoxy paint, also very typical. There was a leak of steam from a flange nearby. I'm sorry to say that steam leaks tend to be rather frequent, especially from flanges. And we could find that there was an electrical field. We could just take an electrical field meter and you could see that near to the steam leak, there was an electrical field. And we also found that the insulation covers of the steam pipe were not grounded. And when we grounded the insulation covers, the sparks disappeared. So what is the explanation here? I've shown a diagram with the steam pipe, the thermal insulation and the insulation covers and the leaking steam. The steam leak caused an aerosol of charged water droplets. And the droplets are charged because they've just come out of high, at high speed from a pipe. And their movement through the pipe has caused them to be charged electrostatically. The droplets hit the insulation cover and charged, transferred the charge to the insulation cover. The charge built up on the insulation covers and that generated an electrical field. And when the electrical field reached three megavolts per meter, I prefer to think in terms of three kilovolts per millimeter, a spark occurred. The spark neutralized the charge on the cover and then it built up again. So the sparking was repeated. What can we learn from this? Inside ATEC zones, all metallic equipment must be grounded. Checks must be carried out regularly, for example, once per year. We should test at least a representative sample of metal items. And if we find problems, then all metal items should be checked. The resistance to earth should be less than 10 ohms. 10 ohms is what you expect for a grounded metal item, and it's clearly not dangerous. The danger level for metal items is anything over 10 to the power 6 ohm. For dissipative objects and for personnel, it is higher, 10 to the power of 8 ohm. Let's go on to the electrostatic discharges we found inside a solid charging chute. We had a customer who complained about sparking from our adipic acid. Adipic acid is a powder, an organic powder. And we supplied this in very large quantities to, to many customers. This customer was working for a, a major oil company and he was situated in Holland. He was complaining about this and I went to see him. Uh, in fact, we supply adipic acid to many different companies in the world. And from time to time, we do get reports of sparking and I investigate them. Mostly we supply adipic acid in type B super sacks. That means they are insulating, but they have a limited breakdown voltage. And for some customers in type C super sacks, that means they are conducting because they want to unload the material in a zone two area. 
and our competitors use the same type of big bags. So the question in my mind when I went to see this customer was why is he seeing sparks when others do not? I visited the site and he told me that in fact the customer sees sparks with all the solids he puts in his installation, not just our adipic acid, all the solids. And this was true for materials in type A, super sacks, which are completely insulating, type B with the breakdown voltage limited to less than six kilovolts, and type C, that's to say conducting with an earth line. They were all, all types of solids from all types of big bags were giving him a problem. So then I looked at his insulation and it's just a typical um, insulation with a funnel leading to a big relay and a rotary valve on the bottom. And he was seeing the sparks at the point where there was a cross piece, a metal cross piece. And in fact, when I looked at the cross piece, it was loose and it was not grounded. The explanation is that there is this loose cross piece in the chute. It's there to catch plastic liners. Charging occurs when the solids pass over the cross piece. The friction of the solid moving against the cross piece generates energy and some electrostatic charge, and this charge stays on the cross piece because it's not grounded. The solid acquires a net charge of one side and the cross piece acquires opposing charges. Its electrical potential rises, an electrical field is generated. The electrical field strength depends on the potential reached and the distance. And the spark occurs when we get to an electrical field strength of three kilovolts per millimeter. Its energy depends on the capacitance and the potential reached. You can get up to 100 millijoules from a typical situation in the industry. And the lesson we can learn from this is that a charging chute for combustible dust is classified zone 20. Inside ATEX zones, all metallic equipment must be securely grounded. Third incident, an electrostatic discharge which occurred during gravity transfer of a solid. The normal process is that cellulose acetate arrives in a hopper by pneumatic transport. And the required quantity is weighed in a hopper. The cellulose acetate is then run down to tote bins which are on wheels. In the incident, a process operator opened the valve on the hopper. That's not an error, that's his job. And there was a loud bang and a flash of light. And the building was filled with a suspension of dust. There was an acrid smell of burning. Luckily, no injuries or damage to the plant. So this was a near miss. What we found, what we know is that a suspension of cellulose acetate in air is explosive. The valve is a butterfly type and the flap of the valve we found after the incident is not bonded. And the properties of cellulose acetate are that it is insulating. It has a volume electrical resistivity of three times 10 to the power of 13 ohm meters. It's explosive. It gives a maximum explosion pressure of 8.5 bar gauge. The lower explosive limit is 30 grams per cubic meter. The minimum ignition energy for material under 63 microns is between 10 and 30 millijoules. And the explanation is that the metallic flap of the butterfly valve is not bonded. Charging occurs when solids pass over the flap. The solid acquires net charge of one sign. 
the, cross, the metallic flap acquires opposing charges and its electrical potential rises. An electrical field is generated and a spark occurs when we get to three kilovolts per millimeter. And in this case, it seems that a dust explosion was ignited but did not propagate. Probably we did not have quite 30 grams per cubic meter. What can we learn? Again, small metal parts, for example, the flap of a butterfly valve are hard to spot. Such metal parts must be securely bonded. The bonding has to be checked regularly. Our fourth incident. This occurred during pneumatic transfer of adipic acid. It occurred because we send some customers adipic acid in big bags and some customers in rail cars. And at this time we were having trouble with adipic acid sent in rail cars. It was caking. That's to say, instead of being a friable solid that you could just take out very easily, it was tending to form a solid, solid lumps. And so we came up with a process to deal with the adipic acid, which has caked. And this meant transferring it from a rail car to a big bag. And so we were sucking it out via an al aluminum tube. And the aluminum tube had a grounding line, which I'm showing in blue. And this was effective, but the process operators found that the, the aluminum tube was too heavy. So a modification was carried out. The modification was to use a PVC tube instead of aluminum. And the operators felt small electrical shocks when they were doing this. So they held on to the old grounding line. The old grounding line was necessary when we had an aluminum tube. With the PVC tube, it was not necessary anymore, but it was still present. And the operators hung on to this grounding line because they were feeling small electrical shocks. We had an incident. Whilst we were doing this operation, at some point there was a loud bang and a flash of light, and an operator received a serious electrical shock. Now, to get a serious electrical shock, you must be talking about at least 250 millijoules. Let's look at the properties of adipic acid. It's resistive. It has a volume electrical resistivity of over 10 to the power of 13 ohm meters. A suspension of adipic acid in air is explosive. You get a maximum pressure of 8.3 bar gauge. The lower explosive limit is 30 grams per cubic meter. And the median particle size is around 300 microns. The minimum ignition energy as is, is somewhere between 30 and 100 millijoules. And if you sieve it carefully, it goes down to 10 to 30 millijoules. So for fine material, just 10 to 30 millijoules is all you need to get the dust explosion. What we think happened here is that we got charging on the walls of the PVC tube. We got charging because there was passage of the adipic acid via the tube, and that generated electrical charge with a net electrical charge of one side, say positive on the adipic acid, and opposite charge inside the PVC tube. And this charge inside the PVC tube over time would attract opposing charges to the outside of the PVC tube. So we get a double layer and a strong local electrical field. 
And this tube is not static. It's actually being manipulated by the operator as he carries out this operation of sucking out the adipic acid. And at some point, it probably touched the bottom of the rail car. And when it touches the bottom of the rail car, the electrical field is distorted. And this leads to what we call a propagating brush discharge, which is a, a very powerful discharge, which can reach up to 1,000 millijoules. One thousand millijoules is what you get in ordinary industrial situations, and we were very lucky here to get no explosion of adipic acid. And the lessons are that we should always prefer conducting materials which are securely grounded or bonded. We should always investigate reports of static. Fifth and final incident a brush discharge inside an electrostatic precipitator. This is for a continuous process. We have feeds of, on the one hand, a mixture of air and sulfur trioxide, which is a gaseous mixture coming in at the top of a reactor. And we have a separate feed of olefin, which is a liquid coming into the top of reactor a reactor, but separately. It's a falling film reactor. It operates around ambient temperature. And what goes out the bottom goes into a cyclone where it is separated. The product is a liquid and it goes out of the bottom of the cyclone. The off gas goes out of the top of the cyclone and it's sent to an electrostatic precipitator. And Inside the electrostatic precipitator, we get solid, and this is neutralized with KOH solution, so an alkaline solution. We got an incident. We lost electrical power to the unit, so the operator shut down the unit, so that is normal. Then electrical power was restored, so the operators restarted the unit. The sulfur trioxide flow was very low, but the olefin flow rate was normal. We got an alarm on high liquid level in the cyclone, followed by an explosion of the electrostatic precipitator. So you can see a photo here, and you can see that the top of the electrostatic precipitator has been blown out. The SO3 inlet to the reactor was found to have been partially blocked by a deposit of tar. This seems to have happened during the power shutdown. The lower explosive limit of the olefin is 0.5% in volume terms. The flash point is 107, whereas the off gas was at ambient temperature. The product we are making is a non-flammable liquid. It's a sulfonic acid. And olefin is less dense than the normal product. So what happened here? When the unit was shut down, a tar deposit formed in the SO3 inlet. When the reactor was restarted, the tar deposit reduced the SO3 flow rate. So we got unreacted olefin which collected in the cyclone. And I'm showing the liquid level in blue. When the olefin got into the system, the liquid level rose. And now that means that all of the gas coming out of the reactor is being bubbled through the liquid. Liquid was then carried over into the off gas to the electrostatic precipitator. And effectively, the gas coming into the electrostatic precipitator contained droplets of hydrocarbon in the form of an aerosol with a concentration over the lower explosive limit, even though we were well below the flash point. 
In the precipitator, you have a high voltage electrode. It's not a problem if what's coming in is just solid. It's a source of brush discharges, but these do not cause the explosion of powders. But if you feed in an aerosol of droplets of odorfin, that's another story. As here, it, we got an explosion as we saw in the photo. What can we learn? An aerosol of hydrocarbon can be explosive below flashpoint if its concentration is above the lower explosive limit. And an electrostatic precipitator is an ignition source for flammable liquids and gases caused by electrostatic brush discharges. What do we need to do to prevent electrostatic discharges that can cause ignition. We need, first of all, to update plans of explosive zones. For gases, use NFBA 497 or IEC 6079-10-1. For dust, NFBA 499 or IEC 6079 part 10 part 2. In the case of overlap of gas and dust zones, we need expert advice. In all types of explosive zone, we should check the resistance to ground of all fixed metal items, connect the ground line to all mobile metal items, scrape the paint of painted drums to get good contact if necessary. In ATEX gas zones, Clothing containing at least 65% cotton should be worn. Dissipative footwear should be worn, and the footwear should be tested or changed at least once per year. The floors should be of bare steel or concrete or small tiles. The objective should be that the resistance of a person from ground is less than or equal to 10 to the power of eight ohms. In ATEX dust zones, the same rules apply unless the dust has a very high minimum ignition energy. In ATEX gas zones, we should have no insulating plastic items, especially no plastic containers over five liters, no powders. In ATEX dust zones, insulating plastic items can be tolerated, but no flammable gases or liquids. We need to speak specialist advice in the following cases. Any overlap between gas and dust zones, because the movement of dust, as we saw, generates electrical charges and is capable of igniting gaseous mixtures. Also loading or unloading super sacks. We need to beware of inerted vessels. Inerting is often ineffective and gives a false sense of security. Some gases, acetylene, ethylene oxide, etc., do not need oxygen to decompose. Some processes produce oxidant gases, such as nitrous oxide. If we are inerting, we need to measure the oxygen levels. Prevention of ignition sources is still necessary. Let's sum up. Static electricity is not caused by black magic. And you can solve the problem even if your name is not Harry Potter. The usual laws of physics apply to this phenomenon. Incentive electrostatic discharges can be prevented by respecting simple rules. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Simon. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, I think it gives a very good image of the complexity of the problems and the need of investigating incidents. So let's see now, I have some questions on the chat. Um, first, there's a question that Martin has answered, if the information will be available. Uh, of this seminar, it, the information will be on the EFC website. That's a general question. 
now coming to Simon's presentation. Cosme Groen asks if the insulation covers are often aluminum. You mentioned steel in the case for the steam leak. Would that give another result? I mean, if it was aluminum instead of steel? Um, it would still need to be grounded, whether it's aluminum or steel. Course. I don't think it would have made any difference. Probably the question is because aluminium is less heavy than, than uh, steel. And that was the reason why the, okay, uh, maybe it's. Yeah, in this case, they were galvanized steel. Steel, okay. Mm. Then Wei Ping Go asked you, uh, is the steam leak, does it have a condensed aerosol form? Why not molecular collisions of water molecules in vapor form? Does it have to be an aerosol? Or no? Yes, it does have to be an aerosol. Yeah. You will not get uh, the buildup generation of electrostatic charges in a gas. A pure gas phase will not give this phenomenon. Okay. Uh, concerning the aluminium, there's a question by Rachel Jones. He says, is aluminum not a risk for thermite sparks in a flammable zone? Um, it could be. Could be. It could be. Thermite is a reaction between aluminum and iron oxide, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it could be. Okay. I don't see other questions. I will just ask you a general question. Uh, all the situations you describe, um, and then you, you speak about standards, but do you think people using standards uh, can really avoid this situation? That, that, that difficulty goes beyond what is described in the standards, or following the standards, nothing would have happened? If you can follow the standard perfectly, and if you are aware of everything that is going on in your plant and know what to look for, and if you are an observant person, you can avoid all of these things. Okay. It is an interesting question now from Lars Fast. Um, he, he said that you measure the electric field of the steam. And the question is, is the measurement reliable or is the field meter uh, affected by the charged particles? Uh, the field meter is affected by the charged particles. That's okay. why we can measure the field strength. I, I guess the question is that the, if the measurement is reliable or not. I mean, uh, well, the particles it, it, are getting inside or. <laughs> yeah. Um, what it's showing is that there is clearly something going on. If you can measure an electrical field, uh, there shouldn't be an electrical field normally, just near to a steam leak. Okay. So it's it's a it's a maybe the you can say maybe the measurement wasn't perfectly accurate, okay. uh, but it, there was clearly an electrical field and there shouldn't have been anything. <laughs> of course, that just two more questions that are here in the question section, and I think we will. If, if there are many other questions, maybe at the end of the session, we can allow some minutes for further yep. questions. Okay, but, uh, I will stay I, online. There, there, are, there are still two questions that maybe you can answer. Yes. Uh, uh, the, from Jochen Boots, how can you apply LEL to a mist the level? Mm. Do you see that? Uh, it's been done. People who are very clever have set up, ex have carried out experiments on the explosion of mists and you can measure the lower explosive limit of a uh, of a flammable hydrocarbon in the form of a mist and you can show that it is pretty similar to the lower explosive limit in the form of a vapor okay and the last one joseph is um the question is if we can control the control of ignition sources 
be relied upon as an effective basis of safety? In, in other words, can you realistically eliminate all ignition sources? In some situations, you can't. In okay. some situations, it's not enough. Okay. Okay. Okay, so thank you, thank you all for the question. Thank you, Simon, for, for your nice presentation. Thank you, Pedro. Let's stay here if there are more questions, and we will move to the to the next one. Uh, I will try to share again my screen. I hope I will success. Yeah, is people watching my screen now? Not yet. Ah. Now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. The following presentation will be done by Philippe Molinier. It's called Understanding Electrostatic Measurements, Basic Principles and Standards, and also Electrostatic Phenomena. Philippe Molinier is an engineer for the Ecole Supérieure d'Electricité, SUPELEC. He obtained a PhD degree from the University Pierre and Marie Curie in 1992. And in the, uh, he works in the field of dielectrics and electrostatics. He's a teacher, cum researcher at Supelec, now Central Supelec. He works on surface potential measurements, dielectric materials characterization, charge ejection into insulating materials, and electrostatic rays. So I will give him the control of the screen. And let's hear it. OK. Um... Do you see my screen? Yes. Yes, yes I see it. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So as uh, Pedro said, uh, I am teacher and researcher in uh, Central Supélec, which is uh, an engineering school uh, in the south of Paris, uh, Gips sur Yvette. And my lab is the Gips uh, laboratory. And this talk has been prepared in association with Pedro, uh, who is the chairman of our working party on electrostatics and uh, of this webinar. And the institution of Pedro, I don't know if you told it, is the ITE in Valencia. So um, I will present a few ideas on the physics involved in uh, electrostatic measurements. And I will illustrate these ideas with example taken from the standards of the International Electrotechnical Commission. But first, let's talk about physics. What are the origins of the static charge and what are the reasons for its dissipation? I will try to draw the general picture. The main stakeholder in the electrostatic game, as you know, is the electrical charge. And when it accumulates, the electrical charge produces various effects, field, force, leading to deformation or aging. But this um, is not the topic of my talk today. But before producing any effect, charge has to be generated. And as Simon said a few minutes ago, static electricity is not caused by black magic. As you can see in this picture, you have to rub a cat. But you also have to take away the charge from the cat. So it's useful in a general way to consider that charge generation is made of two parts, transfer and separation of the positive and negative charges. Then, charge accumulation is depending on the competition between generation and relaxation. This relaxation may be sudden, violent by breakdown, spark, and of course, we usually want to avoid this, especially in a reactive environments where it can lead to fire or deflagration. To prevent this, we have to control the relaxation, usually by some conduction in the material. And partial discharge or corona may also occur and limit the accumulation of the charge. So 
this is the general picture. Here, I will examine a bit further the physics of charge transfer, separation, and relaxation by conduction processes. First, charge transfer. The simplest situation is a contact between two conductors. Assume, for instance, they are insulated from the ground. Contact between a charged conductor and a neutral one will lead to charge repartition according to their capacitance to the ground. Electron transfer also occurs between contacting neutral conductors. And in this case, it may be predicted from the work functions of the metals. This work function is defined as the energy shift between the Fermi level of the metal, where the most energetic electrons are located, and the vacuum level here. This contact charging between two neutral conductors is in fact a problem of electrochemistry more than a matter of electrostatics, since quite low voltages are involved in this case. But if you replace one or two of the conductors by an, an insulator, well, you enter in the field of electrostatics because even a small charge transfer may lead to important effect with insulators and charge will accumulate. Contact charging between insulator or insulator and metals may be described by a table like this, which is a triboelectric series. Materials on the top, like uh, human hair or polyamide or rabbit fur, tend to charge positively, while the materials on the bottom, as Teflon, PTFE or PVC, tend to charge negatively. However, these tables represent a charging tendency only because contact charging in insulators is much more complex than in metals. For insulator, especially polymers, charge transfer is depending highly on molecular configuration. The reason for this is that for insulator, the Fermi level is somewhere in the forbidden gap at a position which is highly depending on impurities, surface states, and so on. So that's a more realistic picture for contact between two insulators is a molecular picture of the electron's energies like this. I won't go into details. I will just say that depending on the nanoscopic picture, the charge exchange may be in one direction or in the other. As a result, charge transfer may be bipolar with positive and negative dots. That's why a material powder can get a bipolar charge by impact on itself. Here is a voltage mapping at millimeter scale of PTFE rubbed by polyethylene, by a foam of polyethylene. And you see here neighboring positive and negative dots which are very steady in time. Here you have 68 hours. So the tribal electric series only shows the net result. Concerning the amounts of net charge transferred, well, it is roughly proportional to the contact area. That's the main reason why rubbing by increasing this area usually leads to a larger charge transfer what we call tribal charging. I will mention then another very important way to transfer charges, which is by gaseous transfer. It may occur, for instance, using a corona discharge, but not only. A partial discharge transferring charges can be produced by any simple tribal charging experiments. There are also other mechanism to induce bipolar charges and electrostatic potentials, 
for instance, by piezoelectricity under pressure, or simply by influence like this, a charged body induces a, in a conductor or even in a dielectric, a polarization. And this first picture is related to influence on an insulated body. But if it's grounded like this and then separated from the ground, it will be left with a net charge. So you see this was a, a fast review of how a charge may be transferred to a material. Now it should be reminded, as an, I mentioned in the introduction, that there is no electrostatic risk without positive and negative charge separation. This is an important idea. Mechanical charge separation is a condition and an important factor of the static risk. A good illustration for this is the Van de Graaff generator, which relies on the belts carrying the charges from the bottom to the upper electrode, where it accumulates, allowing this sphere to reach hundreds of thousands of volts. Well, the same process may happen in the industry, for instance, in conveying liquids or powders in pipes to a reservoir, which can serve in the worst case as a charge accumulator, as the sphere here. Another important remark about charge separation is that contact or tribal charging is usually limited by the back discharge occurring in the air during separation. As I mentioned earlier, gas discharges may be produced by any simple tribal charging experiments. Air is a bad insulator and its breakdown strength is easily attained when static charge is present. Now we have seen uh, charge generation and transport. So a few words about charge relaxation. A material with a given resistivity and permittivity should behave as a parallel RC capacitor. And any charge in the material will be screened by the conductivity following this relationship. And tau here, called the characteristic relaxation time of the material, is the product of the resistivity by its permittivity. However, this simple model is only valid for semiconductors or dissipating insulators, not for charge trapping insulators. These are in fact all the most insulating polymers like polyethylene, polypropylene, PTFE, etc. Here you have a picture of the potential decay for positive and negative polarity of a dissipative insulator. Sorry, it, it is in French. And uh, for a highly insulating material. The difference between them is not only a matter of time constant. Really the shape of the decay is different. For the good insulator, this is a non-exponential decay. The equivalent resistivity and time constant increase with time due to pro progressive trapping of the charge. This you have to keep in mind when you perform electrostatic measurements on insulator. Now, a few words about the electrical resistance measurements that are implemented in the standards. First, a transverse resistance. Here, the measurement electrodes are on both sides of your sample. Sorry, this is in French again, but you see the insulator is in black here. And um, to prevent any surface currents, it is prescribed to use a third quadring electrode surrounding the active measurement electrode and at the same potential. This is a classical setup. The standard voltage will be 10 volts DC or 100 volts if the resistance is too high. And the current has to be measured precisely 15 seconds after the voltage step, 
that has been applied. This is linked to what I told you about the complexity of behavior of the insulating materials. Usually you will have an absorption current decaying with time like this. Here is the decay of the current measured on the polypropylene films at various temperatures. You see that it's very difficult to reach a steady currents, even after days, except at high temperatures. That's why the standards prescribe this precise delay of 15 seconds. But keep in mind that what is measured here, it's not a real characteristic resistance of the insulator, but rather a conventional measurements of the amplitude of these dec decaying absorption currents. Concerning surface resistance, the upper electrode is the same, but there is no need to of a, sorry, of a lower electrode. The measurement is done between the central electrode and the ring surrounding it, which is now part of the measurement circuit. The voltages and waiting time are the same than for the transverse resistance measurements. I will end this section by a concluding remark. These resistance measurements are not electrostatic measurements. The current measurement is dynamic, but here we are rather interested in static. So now let's analyze real electrostatic measurements. First, a few words about electrostatic induction or influence. This is the physical basis of all kinds of electrostatic measurements. Somewhere in space, consider a localized charge distribution or a charged conductor. It emits field lines. These lines are connected to other charges or conductors or to an unknown structure like a wall or ground assumed to be far away. Arriving on the conductor, a field line induces a charge of sign opposed to the inducing charge. If all the field lines arrive at conductors, the total induced charges are exactly opposite to the total inducing charges, as you see here. And in general, between a charge and a set of conductors, or between two sets of charge conductors, the influence may be total or partial. A typical example of total influence is given in the Faraday pale. This picture is taken from this standard about garment testing. The Faraday pale here is made of two conducting containers, the external one being grounded, while the internal one is insulated from the former. Here, the influence is total between the charges contained on the garment and the internal metal container of the Faraday pale. If the garment contains a net charge Q, well, a net charge exactly opposite, minus Q, will be induced on this inner container. And if it is, like here, grounded through a charge measuring device, the charge Q flowing to the ground because of the induction will be directly measured. Another setup here is taken uh, from this European standard. It's an experiment designed for testing the field suppression property of anti-static textile materials. And I think we will learn more about it with Paul Holstock in a few minutes. Let's say that a voltage impulsion is delivered on the large electrode number eight, inducing a charge on it. If the textile, which is here in number six, is insulating, the field lines are influencing the measurement electrode here, number three, and the grounded guard ring um, surrounding it through the textile. But if the textile is antistatic, a charge opposed to Q will screen the influence of Q and field, line, field lines will tend to influence the textile only. 
So for a square in voltage impulse on the generator, the response will be the following on the measurement electrode. The characteristic decay time here is the charge relaxation time on the anti-static textile. So as you see, there are many ways to use this phenomenon of induction. A more sophisticated apparatus is the field mill. The principle of the field mill is that the induction electrode is alternatively phased to the field and to a grounded metal electrode by the use of a rotating shutter, which opens or closes the aperture in front of the induction electrode. So here is an external view of the field mill. And the interest of this setup is to allow a precise zero reference and the signal produced is an AC signal, which is more immune to noise than the DC one. So the field mill is basically a field matter. It is usually grounded. It may be in total or partial influence with the measured conductor or charge distribution. But the introduction of this field mill will have an influence on the potential within the system. And the me measurements will very often depend on the distance with the measured charges. One example of the use of a field mill in total influence configuration is given here. This setup is presented in the same European standard for anti-static garments. The textile, which is number three here, is rubbed by a mechanical device that you can see here, and then transferred in front of a field mill. Here, we can consider that the grounded field mill is much closer to the textile than any other conductor or charge device, so that the tribal charge is in total influence with the field mill. In this situation, from the field measurements, knowing the mean surface of the moving strip, the tribal charge density may be computed. The field mill can also be used to quantify charge decay. Here, we have two different configurations from this IEC standard. The material to be tested here is in number five. It is charged by a corona discharge on a moving plate. And after removal of these plates, charge decay is measured by a film mill here. On the first setup, the influence is mostly on the field mill. From the measurements may be computed the total charge on the film. On the second setup, the sample is deposited on a grounded electrode. So here, the influence is mostly on the back electrode. The field mill provides a signal proportional to the surface potential of the sample and to the product of the charges by their distance to the ground. So these are two different measurements. And of course, the decay of charge in the first case has to be bilateral spreading, while in the second case, transfer processes are favored. A few words now on electrostatic voltmeters. They are re requested in some standards for high impedance measurements of the voltage of a conductor, like here, where the voltage induced by the charge transferred in a Faraday pail is measured using a high impedance voltmeter. Knowing the capacitance of the system, you may deduce the charge. And on the other side of the experiments, another voltmeter may be used to measure the potential of the body after removing the garment. So just one remark here. Of course, this is not a real electrostatic measurement because a small current is necessary, necessary for the voltmeter to operate. So an electrometer with a very high input resistance like this has to be used, but still it will slowly discharge the system. So in fact, the best way to measure an electrostatic potential 
without any perturbation would be to implement a non-contact measurement using an electrostatic probe like this one. The principle of this probe may be seen here. There is a feedback loop allowing to set the body of the probe at a high voltage, cancelling the field in front of it. This is the less perturbing electrostatic measurement. The field lines are much less perturbed by this kind of electrostatic probe than by a field mill. But to operate, the measured charges have to be close to a constant voltage metal electrode, closer what, than what is suggested here. That's why it's rather a laboratory equipment to study fundamental properties of conduction and is not involved in the standards to my knowledge. Okay, I jump to a very short conclusion. So electrostatic measurements may seem simple, but they are not. You have to take into account the complexity of the insulators, the diversity of the practical cases for measurements, the diversity of the instruments themselves. That's why some understanding of physics is useful. And I hope that this talk may have contributed a little, at least. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, for this very nice talk. And um, we are um, just in time because we have to start the, the next presentation. Um, there are some questions that are rising now. Um, or from Norbert Riffler. It's about measuring the charge of particles in an air stream or a filtration plant, how can this be measured? Um, more difficult, yeah. No, I, I'm not, um, uh, well, in, on the industrial side, side, I prefer not to, to be uh, too precise. But if you want the principle of the measure, measurements, in fact, if you want to, to measure um, the charges in a pipe, uh, it depends if it's an uh, insulating pipe. If it's an insulating pipe, you can have just a, a ring around with some cylindrical electrode. Uh, to measure in a metal uh, tube, you have to use an induction probe, in fact, uh, close to the, the flow of the particles. And that the problem then is to have an idea of uh, the type of charge that is made because uh, that uh, type of measurement can only provide the net charge. And if you have bipolar charge, maybe it will be more difficult. Hmm. Okay. Maybe uh, later uh, Jeremy can add something because, of mm -hmm. course, measuring with that, such equipment uh, can also have some risk of explosion or uh, we have to be careful if it's measuring in ATEX zone. So. Um, yes, one, one question from my side, Philippe. Uh, in the standards, when they use the field mills, and you say it's total influence on one side, if it's close to one side of the film or surface, uh, when it's a floating film, a belt, for example, should we need two field mills, one on each side, or, or one in one side it's enough? Well, I, I, sorry, I did not if, hear you. Imagine much. that you have a, a, a belt, a floating yes. belt. And you have the film mill close to the film to the film to measure the, the chart. Is it necessary to put another one on the other side, or does it give not more information? Uh, no, I think it's better to have just one because, well, uh, in theory at least, um, what I said is that you have a total influence between the charges and the film mill. So if you put another film mill on the other side, you will change completely the picture. So maybe you can try with the same film mill in one side and the other side, but if the influence is total, it yeah. should not contribute it too much. It's a consequence of the Gauss theorem. But you have the, the general idea is that you have to be very careful with the boundary conditions of the problem. You see, because yeah. this 
The idea is that the field lines just go to the field mill and don't go away in the other direction. So if it is the, the case, you are in total influence. So if you measure the field, you can deduce the charge on the, the belt. Okay. So thank you again, Philippe. We have five minutes late, so we will move to the next presentation. I don't see more questions, but at the end, uh, if there are some questions, uh, you can write by email to the presenters. So let's move to the next one which is the presentation, where is it, uh, here. Um, I, am I sharing my screen or not, not yet? <laughs> not for the moment. Not for the moment, I will try again. I don't know what's going on with my computer. Okay, not, uh, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Mm -hmm. So I will just minimize these screens here. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so the next presentation is from Dr. Jeremy Smallwood, Practical Measurement for Working in ATX Zones, Application of IEC 6079-32 DART 2. Jeremy de uh, designed an electronic instrument before completing his PhD in electrostatic discharge and emission studies. In 1998, he formed the electrostatic solution a company providing electrostatic consultancy, training and R&D services. He works with British and IEC standards and was awarded with the 2010 ESG Association Industry Pioneer Award. And in 2017, the International Fellow Award at our conference, Electrostatics 2017. So please, Jeremy, uh, when you want, you can start the presentation. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Jeremy, we cannot hear you. Is that better? No, it works. Good. Okay, good. Okay. I tried to share my screen. Let's see if it works. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And you works. see my screen? Yes. yes. Yes, looks good. Okay, thank you. And I'll just... Uh, uh, in a moment, I will try and advance the slide, but for the moment, I will just say um, that uh, uh, my um, presentation is is very practical presentation um, about measurements um, which are most commonly done in the workplace, in other words, the factory. And um, in my experience, actually, not enough people do these sort of measurements because they are um, simple enough to do and tell you an awful lot about whether your equipment works and your static control is working properly. So I hope you find it interesting. Let me just uh, see if I can advance, there we go. So in this presentation, I'll talk first of all about the 6079-32-2 document and its relationship with, uh, in particular, the 6079-32-1 one document which is one of the main ones uh, but also other documents and just a quick overview of the tests that are there now i know that my colleagues have um, gone in much more detail into these things and um, i hope you will uh, then understand uh, from their work um, more about these tests um, when i talk about the um, tests or the common practical measurements that we use in the process industry then I won't go into theoretical details. I will just show um, practical examples of how the test is done in the workplace. So about the um, 6079 documents, uh, the, sorry, 6079-32 documents, um, the two documents are really conceived together. And in fact, the first um, the first edition of 6079-32-1 had tests in it in an annex, which then got separated out into the 6079-32-2. Um, and uh, we felt when we worked on those documents that it was better to have the test methods in a separate document. Um, the 32-1 document is really about guidance on it industrial electrostatics hazards and it covers many many different types of industrial process and situation 
uh, but it's, it's guidance. Uh, it tells you the sort of thing you might be well advised to do in order to make sure that you don't have hazards in your process. Uh, and of course, as, as part of that, it gives you um, some guidance as to, for example, the resistance of a floor or, or resistance of a glove or other things, materials, what's the highest resistance of materials you should have. Now, the question then, of course, is how to measure that. And that's where the 6079-32-2 comes in. That gives you the test methods for use with other standards and in particular the 32-1. But it's not just the 32-1 because the 32-2 uh, document is really intended for use with all the 6079 series. Um, and the tests in um, the other documents, as far as I understand, are um, based on or very similar to the 32-2. There are some subtle differences, uh, perhaps, um, but um, in general, they will be very, very similar. So just to look at the tests that we have in the 32-2, firstly, I will say that every test has a purpose. That's why we have them. And the purpose is to answer a question. And the question is usually to do with seeing whether a material or a piece of equipment is working or is within the limits which are advised by another document. And it's important to remember that the safe limits are defined elsewhere. And in our case, mainly in the 6079-32-1 or in other 6079 documents. But that does not prevent us, of course, using the test methods elsewhere. Um, and in fact, sometimes it is um, quite useful to have those tests to draw on. And certainly I tend to where possible use tests either in the 32-2 document or in other related test method standards uh, to do my consultancy work and test and measurement work in practice. So what sort of um, measurements have we got? Well a lot of them are to do with resistance uh, measurements and in particular we have resistance of materials and we measure this in various different ways surface and volume resistance of the material are uh, the, the main ways of actually looking at uh, solids and um, really the question that we're trying to answer there is is it an insulator is it dissipative or conductive as defined in the 32-1 or some other standard and then for some other types of materials, we have other types of test methods like powders. We have a specific powder resistivity test. And there again, we're trying to find the characteristic of the powder, but in particular, the classification from the point of view of hazard evaluation and what precautions will we need to take in 32-1. The same with liquid. What is the classification of the liquid? Is it low conductivity or medium conductivity or high conductivity? And what are the association hazards to do with that as and precautions as de defined in 32-1? There are a range of other resistance measurements, one of which is um, leakage resistance as it's defined in 32-1. Uh, many of us more commonly known that as a resistance to earth or resistance to ground and that's um, basically a way of finding whether an item or a material is adequately grounded and the grounding system is working and um, it's a measurement from a point or an area on an item through to the ESD earth. And uh, that can be used in many different ways in practice. That's probably the most common measurement that I use actually on site, on a client site. Um, we have a, a related measurement, which is person's resistance to ground through footwear. And also the resistance of test resistance of gloves when worn. And the two um, questions that we're trying to answer there are will the person be adequately grounded via their footwear and via the floor or will the handheld items for example uh, buckets metal buckets or tools be adequately grounded via the glove and via the person 
to the floor or to earth. There are various other tests in um, the document, which we don't tend to use quite so much in a real um, workplace environment, or at least I don't. Um, one of which is capacitance test. And uh, the question there is, is the capacitance that we measure showing that the capacitance is larger than the maximum allowed in the 6079-32-1 and therefore presents an ESD risk or could present an ESD risk. Charge transfer is a similar type of test and this looks at the discharge of uh, a material or an item and see, looks to see whether that could actually be within the range which was, is known to ignite materials in practice. And so those, those uh, measurements tend to be used to evaluate ESD sources, but without ignition tests, so no flammable atmosphere present, to try and work out whether we have a, a, at least a theoretical ESD risk, uh, ignition risk. Ultimately, if you really want to know whether you have an ignition risk or not, then um, it can be preferable to do an ignition test if you have the facilities to do so. This is not something that we would normally do um, in the workplace. Um, these, in fact, all of these or many of these are very often laboratory tests, which we would do on items of equipment or uh, test setup. And then finally, breakdown voltage, and that can be useful uh, for example, in the valuation of uh, flexible intermediate bulk containers and other situations where you might have propagating brush discharges um, so that you can evaluate whether the material is, has a breakdown voltage above or below a required limit. So in industry, the um, tests that I tend to use on in workplaces that tend to be the simple resistance tests most of the time, vast majority of the time, that's, that's what I do. Um, in my laboratory, of course, it's a different matter. And the sort of simple um, equipment which you use, there's examples given here, um, we need a, a resistance meter which can measure a very good range of resistance up until um, well over the gig ohms, uh, depends on what you're going to be, th you think you're going to be measuring. Um, but some of my resistance meters um, go up to tera ohm range, that's million mega ohms range. Whereas um, if you're measuring something like a floor, you can use something which has a much lower maximum resistance than that. Things that need to tend to need to have very high resistance range are things like packaging materials. <clears throat> now, the um, commonly used uh, electrodes for using uh, for, for doing these measurements in practice are um, either to IEC 6130-4-1 or 6130-2-3. I'm sure that there are other um, standards which people use, but these are quite commonly available. Um, and these are available from suppliers of ESD control equipment to the electronics industry. So that makes them uh, very commonly available indeed. And they have the um, characteristics here. They have uh, 64 millimeter diameter, two and a half kilograms, or perhaps a bit uh, less actually for the ones which come from the US. And the conductive rubber face, and that helps the contact between the electrode and the material that it's standing on. Of course, you need test leads of suitable length. Now, that can be an issue in terms of um, test leads for the earthly side of resistance ground measurement. For example, you can need an extremely long lead if you don't find a um, earth contact position close to the position where you're trying to measure. So that can take a little bit of planning. You also need to have connectors to connect through to earth. Um, I, use te I tend to use the words earth and ground to mean the same things. S to some people, it's uh, different, but to me, it's very much talking about the same thing. So I don't distinguish between the two words. Now, the meter um, should measure um, over well over the maximum resistance that you want to measure in practice. So um, it's well you'd be well advised to have a meter which measures to over 10 times uh, the maximum resistance. And similarly, the least resistance to, that you want to measure, you want to have the meter which will 
measured down to a tenth of the minimum resistance. The test voltages, going back to the beginning of this slide, the test voltages are quite important because you do find that the results that you get um, vary tremendously with test voltage and the uh, standards 61340-2-3 and 61340-4-1 and I think also the um, 6079-32-2 um, allow 10 volts and 100 volts. 32-2 also and 61340-4-1 um, also call up 500 volts as an option. I think the 32-2 document also allows 1000 volts as an option um, in some measurements, although personally I don't tend to use that very much. So uh, in the factory, of course, um, you can't actually control the test conditions in terms of humidity and you may well know that um, hum humidity has a massive effect on the results of electrostatic measurements and in particular resistance measurements you can get many orders of magnitude difference in result uh, depending on the humidity of the atmosphere and that means that it's uh, very well advised you're very well advised to measure the humidity in particular temperature as well as good uh, on the day that you make tests and um, if possible if you can choose the day that you make the tests you choose the driest day the driest air conditions that you can many times we don't of course have that luxury and so we just have to work with what we've got now just a quick word about um, ground or earth electrostatic ground for the purposes of these tests is usually the same as mains earth mains protective earth but it's not always and for example in ex many explosives handling um, facilities they have they deliberately have a separate earth um, for the explosive handling areas so that they can't get any problem with um, transients um, coming down the earth line causing problems so sometimes you need to check what you have to use as e as the earth for the measurements point of view um, and that should be spent specified in static control program documents uh, if indeed the company has static control program documents as I hope they do. Um, if it is mains earth you can very often make um, connections direct to mains earth pin with a uh, connector um, but you have to be very careful if you buy your connectors from ESD suppliers that many of them have uh, built-in resistance and if you're measuring lowish resistances then that built-in resistance can also add to your measurement. Of course, if your resistance that you're measuring is very much higher than that built-in resistance, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't um, affect the measurement very much. Uh, very often um, in a facility, there's no mains earths around, but you quite often have machine earths which can be used. And um, I have a good variety of croc crocodile clips um, and that sort of uh, connector so that I can clip onto known earthed equipment or known earthed leads to make earth contact. So here's an example of how you can do uh, leakage resistance measurements and on the right hand side there is a typical uh, measurement of the resistance to ground of a floor. So that's an example of the leakage resistance and in that case the um, electrode is placed on the floor material and the other end of the meter is connected uh, on a long wire in this case to an earth point and the resistance is measured either at 10 volts or 100 volts or another voltage depending on the circumstance. Now this is quite an interesting case because this is an aluminium floor or steel floor sorry metal floor and also it's textured and it's quite often you find that industrial floors are textured and so the flat electrodes that we have from standards don't necessarily make good um, resist, um, contact. In that sort of situation it can be necessary to put a pad of conducting foam in between uh, the electrode and the floor and in order to make a much wider area contract contact. Now the other thing problem that you can get with things like metal floors is that the um, resistance to ground is very very low and typically 
a high resistance meter like the one shown in the picture will stop measuring at uh, say around about a kilo ohm resistance to ground and it will just be off the bottom of the range of resistance. From the point of view of understanding the grounding that doesn't really matter because um, in a way you don't care whether it's a kilo ohm or 10 kilo ohms or zero ohms unless you're worried about the safety aspect. In other words, do you need your floor to actually deliberately have resistance in line with the body to stop your people getting electrostatic risk? So that's, that can be a, a, a consideration in areas where um, electrical um, power is possibly going to be touched by the people work, working in the area. On the left hand side, we've got a, an example of how um, I measured the uh, leakage resistance of a trolley chassis. Was it um, connecting through to the floor through static dissipative wheels? And to do that measurement, I did the same sort of measurement setup, but just made a connection onto the metal chassis um, of the trolley. And it was very easy to demonstrate that the um, trolley was not designed to ground through the wheels and the floor. And uh, uh, so um, not really suitable for use in zone one areas, for example. And uh, um, that's the sort of way that we would use um, these sort of measurements. Now, in terms of measuring um, footwear performance, typical way of checking whether you, your footwear is anti-static or conductive or insulating is to do this sort of measurement where the foot goes onto a uh, metal plate and one end of the metal plate, sorry, the metal plate is connected to one end of the meter and the other end of the meter is connected through to a handheld probe. And using that arrangement, um, you can measure the resistance from the person's body through to the sole of the footwear. And this is actually the measurement that um, commercial uh, pass, go, no, go, uh, pass, fail, go, no, go, footwear testers use, except that they have a, a proprietary box usually mounted on the wall and a plate down below it to put your footwear on. Um, you can do it just as easily if you have a suitable meter. The thing to be aware of here is that your meter has to be safe to use and not present a shock risk to people. And so that means it has to be voltage limited and current limited for safety. And uh, that means that the current has to be limited below a certain level. That level incidentally might uh, depend on your local regulations. So um, this is um, the, another uh, measurement, very similar measurement, except here, instead of the metal plate, we're actually standing on the ESD control floor. And using this measurement, we can measure the resistance through the person's body, through the footwear, through the floor to ground. Now, why is it important sometimes to do that? Well, because not all footwear and not all flooring work together well. And you can get very poor contact sometimes between certain types of footwear and certain types of floor. And the resistance to metal plate test doesn't detect that. But on the other hand, this test, because you're looking at the circuit through the footwear and the flooring, will detect poor contact in that quantity. And this is used, at least in the UK, it's used in exposed lift handling areas. Um, it's not that commonly used in other process industry areas, as far as I know. Um, but certainly, in my opinion, it's a very good test and uh, I would like to see it more, more well used. The safety, key con the safety um, considerations, again, apply here. So the, the meter has to um, be limited in current and voltage to make sure that your user doesn't have electrostatic shocks. Now what have we got here? It looks the same. Well yes it is the same except here I'm wearing a glove and this is a way of measuring a, the resistance through the glove. If you've already measured your resistance through your body and then you put a glove on and measure the resistance again and if it uh, uh, changes significantly that you've then got a good idea of whether the glove is um, putting a, a significant amount of resistance in the circuit and in fact uh, the 6079-32-1 document has a um, uh, has advice as to the resistance maximum resistance of 
the glove. Why is that important? Well, if you're holding, say, a, a steel bucket or a tool in that gloved hand, then you could find, if your glove is an insulating glove, that you have um, an, an non non-earthed metal object in your hand, which could be a risk. So some materials tests. The um, 6079-32-1 uh, document actually gives some options. Um, the main test that it gives is actually a test where you paint electrodes onto a surface. Now that's not very uh, nice test to try and do in a workplace um, or on a routine basis and so these tend to be the ones which I use. The one on the right is a concentric ring electrode according to the IEC 6 uh, one three four zero dash two dash three, and that's a very good surface resistance test for um, flat samples. Um, if you have a curved sample, of course, it doesn't make good contact. But uh, a flat sample and packaging materials and that sort of thing uh, can be measured very well using this type of test. Uh, very useful test indeed. Now. Um, Many people don't have a concentric ring electrode in practice, but they do have the um, two and a half kilogram weight electrodes. They tend to be called weight electrodes in industry. And I did some tests some time ago and published a paper on the results showing that if you place those electrodes approximately five millimeters apart, then you get very, very similar results to the concentric ring electrodes in many cases. And also both of those electrodes will give very similar re uh, results to the painted electrodes in 32-2. So either of those test methods can give you um, ad hoc resistance measurement, which give you a very good idea of the surface resistance of the um, material that you're looking at. So finally, just to finish off, I would say to you, if you depend on something for static control, then you probably need to test it. And the only reason I can think that you might not need to test it on an ongoing basis is because it's a consumable item and you throw it, throw it away rather than test it. So um, if you don't test it, then you can have equipment failures. You can have contamination issues, which stop the equipment working. Um, or your, may, your supplier may have actually um, inadvertently given you the wrong material or the wrong type of tool which doesn't comply with the needs and that can cause uh, risk, ignition risk. And if you don't test, you won't pick these things up. And so um, I have had um, clients who found their cost that uh, um, these wrong materials never got picked up until they had an incident. So my final um, suggestion is that you need to have a test plan and that needs to look at what will you test, how will you test it, how often will you test it, and you need to document the range of acceptable results. And then of course you need to decide what you're going to do when it fails, which is usually to replace or otherwise make good the material or the item that's failed. So um, I think that's the last slide. And um, if we have time for questions, Pedro, then I would be very happy to take some. Thank you, Jeremy, for this very interesting presentation and for showing your experience in, in many cases. That's much, sometimes much more valuable than standards. <laughs> for hearing someone who had made lots and lots of measurements and found problems unexpected problems sometimes. So let's see uh, if there are questions. I may say to people that they can write questions during the presentation, not waiting at the end of the presentation. Uh, let's wait if some question appears. I don't see now. But in the meantime, while people are thinking about questions, Jerry, I, I have one question about your the, present, the, the slide where you show a measurement on a trolley. Yes. Uh, and you say it, it didn't work. Um, it, the, it's not that the measurement didn't work. The measurement no, the trolley, did exactly. The yes. <laughs> the trolley didn't work as a static. Uh, <laughs> what was supposed to do this trolley? You, you should have measured resistance from the platform. Well, 
in some situations, if you have something like a trolley and it goes into a zone one flammable atmosphere area or something like that, then you need to make sure that the trolley is not going to get charged up and be a risk of igniting the flammable atmosphere. And so um, in that situation, it can be uh, necessary to show that the trolley can be grounded, through, usually through its real wheels and the floor. And um, so in that case, you would put uh, static dissipative wheels on the trolley and make sure the trolley um, is grounded through the chassis, through the wheels um, to the floor. Um, but um, many people, of course, don't realize that. Or, and so they, or, or even if they do, sometimes they confuse the trolleys which do comply with that requirement with the uh, trolleys which don't. And so they can get swapped about in the workplace. And so you need a way of checking the trolley to see whether it um, mm. is is groundable or not. Okay. Yes. So some years ago, I, I I got a problem. They they called us with not ATX zone, but supermarket trolleys. Yeah. <laughs> where yeah, customers yeah. <laughs> get discharged from trolley, and it was a, a, a difficult problem to solve sometimes. That that it, that is a favourite uh, problem <laughs> in in retail establishments, isn't it? Yes, and, and of course, the, uh, the other part of the story there is always the floor, because even if, for example, you have static dissipative wheels on a trolley, then it, it won't do the job unless you also have a uh, static control floor. And in a retail establishment, you very often do not. Yeah. Um, and so uh, you can get problems there. Yes, I, I used to regularly get shocks in the wine <laughs> department of my local <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pleased to say that they have now changed the floor and it works very well. <laughs> it didn't stop me buying wine though. Yeah, okay, of course, of course. <laughs> I think this chat will not stop you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. So I don't, I don't see more, more questions if I'm not wrong from the audience. So let's, let's move to, to the next presentation. Thank you again. Uh, My pleasure. As you can stop sharing your screen. I will try and do that, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to see what I have to press. Uh, stop the, share. There we go. Okay. Now I try to that. share mine. It is not uh, <laughs> also very sure that it will work. Okay. Yeah. Not. I am. Is it visible my screen now? I think it's so. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's so the. Thank you. The next one is uh, Dr. Paul Holstock. He will present uh, uh, a lecture about electrostatic properties of protective personal equipment and development of new full garment test methods. He graduated from the Manchester Polytechnic University in 1987, and he joined the Shearling Institute, now part of the British Textile Technology Group, as a research officer in the electrostatic laboratory. He completed his PhD thesis on electronic damage caused by electrostatic discharge from textiles in 1999. And he now operates his own business and he's, he's an active member of many standards committees. So uh, a life devoted to electrostatics also. So um, Paul, we will be pleased to see you. I will stop sharing my screen and leave you room for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Pedro. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes, it works. Yes, fine. Right, that's great. Thank you. Um, also, I'd like to thank EFC for giving me the opportunity to um, give you this presentation this afternoon. Um, yes, yeah, so my presentation is about uh, PPE, uh, what PPE is, why we need to measure the electrostatic properties of PPE. Um, going to talk briefly about the ATEX directives and the PPE regulation um, and really the relationship between the two um, because sometimes there is a little bit of confusion um, about the which of those um, to apply to PPE uh, for use in ATEX environments. Um, but the, the main part of the presentation, certainly the second part, will be dealing with the European standards and particularly the SEN Technical Report 16832 and the EN 1149 series, 
which deals specifically with PPE. Um, I'll then talk at the end of the presentation about the limitations of the existing test methods that we have in the standards and the, the work that we are currently doing on the development of full garment test methods. So PPE is personal protective equipment and that is any equipment that is carried or worn by people to protect against specific hazards. And these include everything from helmets, ear defenders, uh, visors, goggles, breathing protection in the form of respirators, footwear protection, shoes and boots, uh, gloves, and of course, um, clothing, or indeed any other equipment that is designed to protect um, people from health and safety hazards. We need to measure the electrostatic properties because PP is often worn by personnel in, in industrial environments with potentially explosive atmospheres, which can be created by solvent vapors, gases, or combustible dusts. And most static, or most PPE rather, is made from insulating materials. You think about a, a plastic helmet or the, the plastic that uh, are used in, um, in goggles and, and visors, and indeed synthetic materials that might be used in clothing. And that means that the the materials and the objects, the, the PPE, can acquire um, static electricity as a result of everyday activities, just like walking or rising from a seat. And that electrostatic charge, if it discharges in the form of a brush discharge, can actually cause the ignition of a flammable atmosphere. So when we're talking about um, ATEX, and uh, potentially explosive atmospheres. The, the word ATEX itself comes from the, the French term atmosphere explosive, and the directives in Europe define the health and safety requirements for industries in which operations include potentially explosive atmospheres, whether they be created by um, gases, vapors, um, or dusts. There are actually two ATEX directives. The ATEX workplace directive and then a separate directive that deals specifically with um, equipment um, designed for use within um, potentially explosive atmospheres. So what does the, the ATEX directives tell us? Well, first of all, the, uh, the workplace directive. This requires employers to identify operations that include powders, liquids and gases that could form potentially explosive atmospheres. Employers also have to categorize the areas according to the probability of occurrence of potentially explosive atmospheres. Once we've identified that there is a, uh, an operation that involves a potential explosive atmosphere, we then have to take uh, precautions according to the directives. And there are three main lines of um, protection um, that we need to, to address. And I think this answers one of the questions from um, Simon's presentation about whether we can just um, eliminate ignition sources. So the, the first precaution we, we need to take is whenever possible to prevent the formation of a potentially explosive atmosphere. So if we're handling a flammable liquid, we can prevent the formation of an explosive atmosphere if we use inerting, if we replace the the air or the oxygen um, with an inert gas like carbon dioxide or, or nitrogen. So that's one way to prevent a potential explosive atmosphere even when we're handling uh, a flammable liquid. But of course that's not always possible. So then the second line of defense is to identify and eliminate all possible ignition sources. And as I've just explained, um, electrostatic discharges are one possible um, source of ignition and that's what I'm going to concentrate on in this in this presentation eliminating electrostatic discharges as a form of, of ignition. The third um, line of defense within the ATEX directives um, we what we try as much as possible to eliminate the risks by eliminating the potential explosive atmosphere and eliminating ignition sources but we have to um, be conscious that our efforts may not always be 100% successful and we still have the risk of an ignition and a potential explosion. And then we have to make sure that the effects of that explosion, if it does occur, um, are minimised. And that usually involves 
um, some form of explosion venting so that any energy that's released as a form of explosion um, causes minimum damage to facilities and certainly um, does not seriously harm um, or even cause fatalities um, to workers. So that's the, the third and ultimate line of defence. But as I say, I'm going to concentrate on that second one, the elimination of the ignition sources. So as part of an explosion prevention risk assessment, an employer might identify electrostatic discharges from PPE as a possible ignition source. The workplace directive then places an obligation on employers to ensure that their workers are provided with PPE that is safe for use in potentially explosive atmospheres. And this is where there is some confusion because it's the, it's the ATEX directive and the risk assessment associated with that that identifies the need for static protective PPE. But then it's the PPE regulation that determines the, the requirements and the certification required for the PPE. It's not the ATEX equipment directive that applies to, to PPE. Um, and there is some com confusion there because you often hear the term um, ATEX approved or ATEX certified PPE. The approval and the certification of PPE is always um, dictated by the, the PPE regulation. Um, and that is made clear within the ATEX directives themselves uh, in the de definition of equipment. Uh, it's clear from that definition that PPE is not um, equipment in the form of um, that that's covered by the directive. And the scope of the directives also make it very clear that um, the, the, the equipment directive does not apply to PPE. So when we're looking for the requirements for PPE, we need to look for the um, the PPE regulation. So the PPE regulation um, was uh, published in 2016, um, came into effect a couple of years ago in 2018, and this contains the essential health and safety requirements that all PPE needs to comply with. There's also requirements for the EU type examination and conformity assessment or CE marking. So every item of PPE that's placed on the market in, in the EU needs to be CE marked to show that it um, complies with the essential health and safety requirements. Now, the simplest way of demonstrating conformity is by testing to and complying with harmonized European standards. It's not the only way. Um, it is possible to um, do other evaluations provided those evaluations are acceptable to um, a notified body but the easiest way is to test and comply with the harmonized European standards. And these are standards where there is a presumption of conformity. In other words, if you comply with the standards, it's presumed that you um, are satisfying the, the relevant parts of the um, regulations, essential health and safety requirements. So the first standard I want to look at is what we call the SUCAM document. Uh, this is a SEN technical report 16832 and SUCAM means selection, use, care and maintenance. So this gives us guidance on how to select, how to use, how to care and maintain for our PPE. And before I go any further, I'd like to um, point out one very important presumption um, within all our standards relating to uh, static protective PPE. And that is that it's worn or used by personnel that are properly earthed where the resistance to earth is less than 10 to the 8 ohm. And that's normally achieved by a footwear and flooring, as Jeremy has described, um, or by other means. It may be may, um, possible to use wrist straps if the operations involve a person at a, um, a fixed workstation where they're not moving around too much. But in most cases, um, earthing means via footwear and flooring. And all our requirements are based on that fundamental um, presumption. So selection of PPE, um, which is what I'm going to concentrate on in the, in the test methods, is based on, first of all, risk assessment, taking account of the occurrence of potentially explosive atmospheres and the probability of charging. And within the SUCAM documents, there's extensive reference made to the 600.079.32-1. Um, it references actually the Senelec version of that document, 
but the, the Senelec and the IEC versions are identical. Uh, it's just the, the title uh, or the number that's different. The actual technical contents are, are identical. So it's quite a, the, the SUCAM document is quite extensive in terms of all the, um, the various guidance that it gives, but it summarizes everything in this, this table. Um, this table summarizes the, or tells us where we need to use um, electrostatic dissipative protective clothing and other items of PPE. So it's a somewhat complex table to begin with, but if we, we take it step by step, if we look in the first column, this defines the hazardous zones. So zone zero, zone one, and zone two. These are zones that where a potentially explosive atmosphere may be created by either gas or vapors. So zone zero is where the hazardous atmosphere is continuously present. Zone one is where the, the atmosphere is likely to be present or is present for um, a large part of the time. Zone two is where in normal operations, the um, explosive atmosphere cannot be expected um, to be there, but we cannot eliminate the possibility that it, that it is there. Um, so if you're handling a, um, a flammable liquid, whatever precautions you take, you cannot always guarantee that you eliminate the explosive atmosphere that may be created by that. So that would be a zone, zone two area. And then the third um, set of zones there, the zones two, zero, two, one, and two, two, it's the same principle, um, but these are zones where the potential atmosphere, potentially explosive atmosphere rather, is created using uh, by powders or dusts. The second column uh, is self-explanatory. It's a probability of charging, and we characterize that as either high or low. And then we move across to these columns, which define the sensitivity to ignition um, in terms of the minimum ignition energy. And this is the least amount of energy in an electrostatic discharge required to cause ignition. So we divide it into two. So uh, when the ignition energy is less than 0.2 millijoule, or where we have um, ignition energies greater than 0.2 millijoules. And then the final column, um, again, it's related to the ignition energy, but now we're talking about powders and dusts. So if you notice on, if you come down for the powders and dusts and go over to the zones, we see that um, the PPE, uh, the PPE or static protective PPE is not required. And that's because if we have just insulating materials, the only type of discharge that we can expect is a brush discharge. And we know that brush discharges cannot ignite powders or dusts, but they can ignite um, atmospheres created by gases or vapors. So whenever we have gases or vapors, we see that PPE or static protective PPE is either recommended or required. The only place that it's not required um, is when we have in zone two, where we have this low probability of an explosive atmosphere being present, and also a low probability of charging. But everywhere else, we see that um, static protective PPE is either recommended or required. So in terms of the recommendations for particular um, items, there are actually only three items of PPE where there are specific requirements within the product um, standards, and that's footwear, gloves, and clothing. So within the SUCAM documents, we do um, cover other items of PPE, but we there refer to the 60079 series and the EN 1149 um, for test methods and performance requirements that may be used. So if you look at gloves, um, for example, the, the relevant product standard is EN 16350, and that is based on measuring the resistance through the glove, um, the vertical resistance or the transverse resistance. So we're measuring the resistance between a cylindrical electrode on the, on the surface of the glove and a metal plate beneath the glove or the glove material. And that resistance needs to be less than 10 to the 8 ohm. And that ensures that any hand tool uh, particularly metal hand tools or all the conductive hand tools are grounded or earthed um, via the operator. So um, it's making sure that we have a low resistance between any 
um, conductors held in the hand and the earth person. And we do a similar test with footwear. Uh, in this case, with the footwear, we place stainless steel balls inside the shoes or the boots and measure between those um, metal balls and a metal plate um, underneath the, the footwear. And the resistance needs to be less than 10 to the 5 ohm for conductive footwear or between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 9 ohm um, for anti-static footwear. And the, the relevant test method is ENISO 20344. Um, that's the test method. And then the performance requirements are specified in ENISO 20345, 20346, or 20347. Well, this method or this test is only measuring the, the resistance of the soles. So the upper part of um, any footwear, the upper part of boots, for example, um, or leg protectors, as I said before, the the SUCAM document refers us back to the 60079, um, either the 32-1 for performance requirements or the 32-2 for test methods, or indeed to 1149 series um, to give us guidance on what test methods we can use and what performance requirements we can use. And Philippe and Jeremy have explained some of those test methods that are, are applicable uh, or can be adopted for other types of PPE. So in terms of garments, we then come on to the EN1149. And garments are really um, one of the few items where there is quite extensive um, performance requirements and test methods related specifically to electrostatic properties. So we're starting with, at the end of the series, EN1149 part five. Um, and this is where all the performance and design requirements are specified. Part one to four, um, contain the, the various test methods. So to define a, an electrostatic dissipative protective um, material, we have to comply with one of any of these three requirements. It's not all three. We only have to comply with one, um, at least one of them. We can comply with all of them if they do, but we only have to comply with one. So the first is surface resistance of less than 2.5 times 10 to the 9 ohm on at least one surface, and it only needs to be one surface, not necessarily both, measured according to the N1149 part one, for a half decay time of less than four seconds, tested according to the N1149 part three test method two, which we refer to as the induction charging method, and has already been explained by uh, Philippe in his uh, presentation earlier, or a shielding factor of greater than 0.2, again, um, tested according to that same method, ELN 1149 part three, test method two. So let's have a look at those test methods um, briefly. EN 1149 part one is a straightforward resistance measurement, um, as already explained by, by uh, Philippe in his presentation and by, by Jeremy in his presentation. And this can be used for testing homogeneous materials. For example, if we have um, cotton material, or a synthetic material that's been treated with a, a, topical, um, a topical finish. Or it can be used with um, fabrics containing um, conductive yarns. And these can be stainless steel, or um, they may be silver coated or copper sulfide coated, or they could be carbon-based yarns where the, the carbon impregnated layers of polymer are actually accessible on the surface, either completely surrounding the surface or in this sort of hamburger configuration, or in stripes along the surface. Or we can um, perhaps test inherently conducting polymers where the, the cross section of the yarn is effectively um, entirely conductive. And these are, are possible because the electrodes can make contact with the uh, conducting elements. Where we run into problems is, is trying to measure materials with core conductive yarns. And this is where the conductive elements um, the carbon core, either circular cross-section or this trilobal cross-section, which is also used in, in PPE, the electrodes cannot actually measure or cannot actually contact the conducting element because of the insulating polymer that protects the, uh, protects the core. So we need an alternative method of measurement. And this led to the development of EN 1149 part three, 
And there are two methods in there, but it's only method two that's used for PPE. The other method is a tribo charging test, which again, Philippe um, des described earlier, but the only one that we can use for PPE is the induction method. So on the left, we see the um, what's called the induction charging um, method one apparatus. Uh, this is the actual apparatus here, and this is the schematic. Um, it is similar to the one that was shown by Philip earlier. So we start with a fabric specimen which is clamped on in this earth clamping ring. Uh, it's also in contact with a, an earth support, so the, the fabric is earthed on both sides. And we establish an electric field by applying a step voltage to, the, um, to this ring electrode, which you can just see in this diagram in the center of the, um, the clamp there. So this is the field generator, and then we monitor the field with a field meter above the, the fabric. So this is the a typical response that we'd see for a homogeneous dissipative material. So this is something like a, the, the sort of cotton material uh, or something with a topical finish where the whole material essentially has got the same um, level of dissipation. So this chart, the, the x-axis is time. The y-axis is the measured field at any given time divided by the maximum field, which is the field measured without a specimen. So initially, when we apply the, the voltage, the step voltage to the electrode, we see the, the maximum field is recorded. And then as the induced charge um, starts to dissipate to the um, earth clamping arrangement, we see the, uh, the field reduce or decay. And the time taken for the field to, to decay to half its initial value is taken as the half decay time. And that's the the parameter that we measure um, in this test. Now, if we have conductive yarns in the material, these are highly conductive materials. So for those, um, for those parts of the material, this same um, process happens, but the decay is very quick. In fact, it's so quick that in the time it takes us to start the recording, we may not actually see the whole of that decay process. So what we tend to see with materials with conducting yarns is that the initial field that we measure is somewhat lower than the, the maximum value. In fact, on this example, we see that we just see the tail end of that initial rapid decay. And this gives us another parameter that we can measure because in effect, what's happening now is that the, the conductive yarns are providing some shielding from that um, of the um, field meter from the, the field that's, that's generated. And we can use that as a measuring parameter. So the shielding factor is defined as one minus the field just at, at the end of that initial rapid decline divided by the E max. So it's this value here of E R divided by the E max. And again, we can, we can also measure the half decay time but you notice that the half decay time is still defined as the time taken to get to half the Emax value. So it's not half of this value, not half of this value, it's half of the Emax value. In other words, half of the, the maximum field without a, a specimen. So that gives us the, the two parameters that we can measure. Now, you might already be asking, why do we accept four seconds as a, an acceptable decay time or a shielding factor of only 0.2 as, uh, as acceptable. Um, this is not a theoretical calculation. This is based on empirical matching. Um, and we did this work, um, well, it started 24 years ago uh, in a four framework pro project um, under the um, EU uh, framework program. There were four partners working on this across Europe. And we looked at uh, 44 fabric samples. Uh, in fact, some of the samples were washed. So the unwashed and washed samples, we had over 70 different materials covering the broad range of materials that are available on the market. So woven and non-woven materials, uh, natural and synthetic blends, materials with topical finishes, materials with conducting yarns, uh, in different types and different configurations. So from anything from 20 millimeters 20 millimeter stripes down to five millimeter grids. 
And what we did was compare the results of the candidate charge decay methods that we were looking at. And this um, induction method was only one. We did look at others. But this is the one that we ultimately chose. But we looked at all of them and compared those with ignition testing results. And we did two, type of, two types of ignition test. The first is where we take a specimen of fabric, a charged specimen of fabric, and place it in a, a sealed chamber. We fill the chamber with a gas air mixture and then bring an electrode up to the surface to initiate an electrostatic discharge and to determine whether ignition occurred. This is a good method in the sense that we have a very controlled um, explosive atmosphere here, but the disadvantage is that the time taken to, um, to fill the chamber and to bring the electrode up to the, to the sample, um, that elect the, the charge sample may have shown some charge relaxation. So the other method we used is to use a, a gas emitting probe. And here we see on the, on the right part of this diagram is all the gas mixing apparatus. And this feeds uh, an explosive mixture of the gas over an electrode. And then this whole probe can be brought up to a specimen of fabric or indeed to a garment, or in some cases to a garment that's being worn by a person. And we can determine whether a, a discharge to that electrode will ignite the, the local flammable atmosphere can, created just in front of the electrode. So we have the two, the two methods of doing the ignition testing. And what we then do is rank the materials according to whether or not ignitions occurred from earth specimens or garments. And again, we're using the concept that the garments will always be worn by a person um, who is properly earthed. We also rank the materials according to the measured parameters. And we looked at different parameters, not just decay time. Um, it might be the, the field after a certain length of time. Um, and the decay time might not just, just have been the half decay time. It might be the decay time down to, to, down to one tenth or one over E. But the idea was to have um, different ranking lists and then to compare those ranking lists to determine if there was a parameter that could define the boundary between those materials that caused ignition and those materials that didn't. And once we'd, we'd got that and we got the candidate test methods, we presented these findings to the, um, to the SEN project team that was developing the, uh, the standards. And within that project team, there were further interlaboratory trials carried out to um, further refine the, the limits. And this is how we we derived the, um, the limits of a half decay time less than four seconds or a shielding factor of greater than 0.2. The important point to remember is that because those limits are derived from this empirical matching process, it's important that the test methods are those that have been specified and been used during the, the research program. So we can't carry out a decay time according to using tribo charging or corona charging, the other methods that um, Philippe uh, explained earlier, we have to use that induction method and that very specific induction method um, in order for the, um, the performance requirements to be valid. Now, one of the limitations that we face with either using 1149 part one or part three is that we're only testing material. And the assumption is that the whole garment is made from that same material. And if the garment is made from that material, then... Sorry, I'm hearing somebody else on the, on the line. Um, okay, maybe it's my imagination. Um, sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so if we're making a garment from entirely the same material, that's fine. We know in practice that there may be a requirement to put labels on a, on a garment or to have some form of external attachments for high visibility. And we do allow for that within 1149 part five at the moment um, by making reference to the area or width restrictions for non-dissipative materials that are defined within the 60079 document. Now that's, that's where we're at at the moment, but 
protective clothing has become more complex and it's commonly required to protect against multiple hazards and that means we have multiple materials and multiple attachments and the restrictions that we um, impose based on the 60079 cannot always be achieved without compromising protection. So if we consider a simple garment made from entirely the same material, perhaps with just a, a thin stripe of retro reflective material, the requirements that we have work quite well for the, this type of uh, product. But this is more typical of what we see now with protective clothing. And this is, I think this is perhaps a, a firefighter's assembly where we have protective pads on the knees, on the elbows. We have, and these are uh, obviously much larger than the, the aerials um, defined within the 60079. We have quite wide um, stripes uh, or patterns of retro reflective stripes for high visibility reasons. We perhaps have um, D rings and buckles or different materials um, on different parts of the garments. Here we have a different material on the shoulder pads. So how do we ensure that we um, are still ha have a, a safe garment? And this, what we need is a, a full garment test. So the requirements for a full garment test, obviously we need to test a full garment. We need to charge all parts of the garment, um, including any attachments. And that charging must represent worst in, worst in use conditions. The measurements must be made on all parts of the garments, including the attachments. And the measurements, whatever we make, must relate to the probability of ignition risk. So what we're looking at at the moment are um, some methods being developed by Inneris in France and SDFI in Germany. And they're both similar methods. So this is the, the apparatus um, that's used at Inneris, but the uh, the principles are very same, very similar at the um, in the equipments for STFI. So we have a mannequin which is covered with a skin simulant. Um, you can just perhaps see it at the bottom of the the leg of this garment is that there is a white material there, and that is a skin simulant. In other words, it's a low resistance layer of material that simulates the low resistance of the the skin. So again, we're working on this principle of the, the garments being worn um, on a, uh, a low resistance path to, to earth. The mannequin is on a turntable here and we have a corona array which is fixed. So as the, the mannequin on the turntable is, is rotated, the corona array sprays charge onto the surface of the garment. We're also looking at a handheld corona array that can perhaps be used to charge individual components on the, on the garment. Once we've charged the garment, we can measure different parameters. So we might use an electrostatic field meter or a voltmeter, and we can relate that to what we perhaps um, know already as a, a performance requirement. So for example, in the EN61340-6-1, this is actually for healthcare, um, or healthcare environments, the surface potential should be less than a thousand volts. It may be that that's also applicable for our applications. It may be that we have to have different um, different performance requirements. But that's one parameter that we can measure. We can actually measure the discharge. We can actually have an electrode that we bring up to to the garment and to pass a uh, a brush discharge, which then can be connected to a measuring circuit and we can measure, for example, the total charge transferred. And again, we have uh, some examples in, in existing standards. So to prevent the ignition of hydrogen, for example, we need to have a charge transfer of less than 12 nanocoulomb. But again, we need to determine whether these requirements are suitable for our application. So it may be that we, um, we could measure, for example, the peak current or the charge transferred within a, a certain limited time. What we will be doing um, to compare uh, or to provide the, the basis of the, um, the comparison is actually doing some ignition tests with the gas probe again. But if we don't find a correlation with these other methods, then it's possible that the gas probe itself could be part of the, the test method. Although it's, it's more problematic 
um, doing this in a um, in a, a typical laboratory um, because of the the health and safety hazards of actually using flammable atmospheres for testing. So we prefer to have um, a test method that does correlate um, to ignition. Um, but if we can't find that correlation, then we could uh, indeed have a test method based on uh, ignition testing. So this is where we're at at the moment. We've started initial testing, um, and this is being carried out by Inaris and STFI. We were hoping to have the, that testing completed this summer, but for, for obvious reasons that uh, has not been possible. But we're now um, hoping to be able to discuss at least those initial testing in the first half of next year. And after that, we'll be um, developing a, uh, a more extensive program of testing. And ultimately, the, the test methods that we uh, develop and the performance requirements um, will um, be incorporated into the 1149 series and the test method will become EN 1149 part four. Uh, we will we'll also, um, again, this was supposed to have been done this year, but hopefully we will be looking at the SUCAM document again to see if there are any uh, refinements or changes that are required for that, which is just the normal review process that is uh, required of any uh, European standard. And again, we hope to be doing that, fingers crossed, um, sometime next year. Um, so thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much, Paul. I think we are on the limit of the time of the webinar, but we have one question for you. Uh, it's uh, from Fritz Sobler. He says that uh, which type of shoes should we wear in zone one, conductive or anti-static shoes, uh, with this condition that persons are grounded when its resistance to earth is lower than 10 to 8 ohms. Zone one, but uh, rounded, people are rounded with 10 to 8 ohms. Yes, it's, um, there's a, the slight confusion because the the EN 20345, 20346, 20347 defines anti-static and conductive footwear. Um, in terms of what we need within a um, hazardous zone defined within ATEX and within the 60079 series is a resistance of, of resistance to ground of less than 10 to the 8. Um, we don't make a distinction between anti-static or conductive. It's defined in terms of that resistance value. So you could actually use either. Um, you could use conductive certainly because that, that is always going to be less than, than 10 to the 8. But anti-static if you use the qualification test, um, 20344, the measurement that you might get could be above 10 to the eight. But that, remember, is a measurement between stainless steel balls inside the shoe and a plate underneath the shoe. In reality, what you're looking for is a resistance, as Jeremy has described, where you're measuring from the person through the footwear, through the flooring to, to earth or to ground. Um, that is the important parameter that is defined within the 60079. And irrespective of whether you're in um, zone one or zone two, if you're in a, a hazardous zone, your resistance should actually, or zone zero to be honest, your re resistance should be less than 10 to the eight. So, most, you'll find that most footwear, even when it's described as anti-static, will have a resistance of, to ground of less than 10 to 8 when it's being worn um, by people. We have to be careful because there may be some that are just on the upper end of that limit of qualification where they're 10 to the 9 ohm um, in qualification and they may still just be above 10 to the 8 um, in reality. I'm sorry, that's a, a slightly convoluted answer, 
but it's yeah. it's a, a problem. We we have tried our best to um, get the people that write the the footwear standards to um, relate more directly to the end use application. But it's a difference between having a test method that you can use for qualifying and the method that you use um, in an end use application. Pedro, if, uh, if you have time, and I don't want to keep Paul from any other questions for him, but if you have time, I could offer a comment there. Okay, Jeremy, you want to answer? If you have time, um, if, if there are no more questions for Paul, then I could uh, offer a comment there. Okay, and there, there's one more question for Paul, but the, the, the comment is welcome now, I think. So we'll go on. Yeah, there. okay, okay. Um, Paul did a very good summary, I think, of the uh, some of the difficulties between footwear measurements and um, real measurements of real resistance from the person to ground. And the footwear flooring system and person footwear flooring system is actually surprisingly complicated in how it works and it doesn't give the answers that you would expect. So a measurement of the through resistance of the footwear is not necessarily a good representation of um, the resistance from the person's body through the footwear um, to metal plate if you measure the body to metal plate for example and if you measure the resistance of the person's body through the footwear through the footwear through the flooring to ground it is not predictable from either of the other two measurements yeah. Um, and one of the big factors there is that you have contact resistance between the floor and the footwear and that contact resistance can be very high or it can be very low. So I have seen um, systems, for example, where you have a floor which measures at 10 mega ohms and you have a footwear which measures 10 mega ohms resistance from the person to metal plate. And yet when you have the person standing on the floor, you have a resistance to ground from the person. Um, of um, maybe a thousand mega ohms or more. And, and similarly, sometimes you can get actually a lower resistance than you expect. And it's all to, all to do with the way that electrodes work with the uh, flooring and the footwear and uh, these test methods are not necessarily correctly representing the real world. Um, what I would say is that if you are really worried to make sure that the resistance from your person's body through to earth is, is within strict rim limits, as they are, for example, in the explosives industry where they're handling, I'm talking about munitions, you know, things that um, the armed forces use, then you really need to measure the performance of the system from the body, through the footwear, through the flooring to ground. That's really the only way to tell how the system is working. Good, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Just the very last question uh, for, for Paul, from Marion Schiller. Will harnesses also be tested under the standard for full garment? If someone wears harnesses? In, in principle, yes. Um, this is something that we need to um, consider as, as part of the development process of, of, the, of the standard. Um, in principle, there is no reason why a harness could not be put on top of the, the mannequin and tested um, on its own um, or on top of a representative garment, for example. Um, so, yes, anything that um, can be fitted on the, the mannequin, in principle, we should be able to, to test. Um, and that's one of the things that we don't really cover in the SUCAM document at the moment because there was no, no test method. Um, so we're making reference um, as much as possible to, to harmonize standards, but when there are no harmonized standards, we have to uh, refer back to the 60079. But once we have this full garment test, maybe then within the SUCAM document, we can provide more, more guidance on things like um, harnesses or anything else that might be um, worn. Um, in addition to, to garments. Okay, so thank you. I think now it's really finished. Thank you, Paul, for your 
nice presentation and giving this insight on how the standard was built and how the standard are moving for the future for complex situations. And um, okay, I would like to close just the seminar and I'm sharing my screen, just finishing. Uh, yes, for memoriam of Professor Giri Gajewski, I, earlier I didn't show his slide. He was, uh, he was organizing the, our next conference and sadly he passed away. And um, I will just remember to all the events uh, that the call for paper for electrostatics 2022 is open. And uh, here you can find also all the presenters' emails if you want uh, to further discuss with them any questions or, or any doubt that were still not answered during the seminar. Um, so I would like to thank again ESC for this webinar, for this opportunity, and all the presenters for the contributions. I think they were very clear and they gave us a lot of information, very useful information from theoretical to applied cases and uh, mm, okay I, I will just uh, say to all the audience thank you for attending and encourage them to follow the next webinars of the ESCE along this week and the next week and hope that it will also be of great interest I'm very happy to see that we had a, a large audience uh, until the end so um, thank you all and uh, Let's see in the next webinar, seminar, or conference. Thank you all.